Hi everyone, uh, thanks for taking the time to listen to this talk. I'm Caroline Lehman. I work across the global tropics on savannah and grassland ecology and biogeography. I'm based at the Royal Botanic Garden Edinburgh and the University of Edinburgh and unfortunately I am in cold Scotland instead of uh, in warm Tana. I like to start this talk with a slide that shows the Drakensberg Mountains in South Africa. Uh, it's an extensive region of Afromontane grasslands. It's an environment that's very similar to the central highlands uh, of Madagascar. And I think that that is an, an illustrative case of the ecosystem typology uh, that I'm gonna talk about. So the global typology of Earth's ecosystems, it's a new, essentially a dictionary for all of Earth's ecosystems, but defined by the functional and compositional attributes of ecosystems as opposed to structure. This is actually a really big move forward uh, for global ecology and biogeography and how we're now able to integrate decades of ecological theory and thinking that has been drawn out uh, essentially through local studies and put this into a global framework. And this global framework has been developed by a team of around 30 ecologists. And in addition to that, uh, it's been reviewed uh, and criti critiqued by many others. The typology, so sorry for the complicated graph. This. Uh, graph essentially is the key model of ecosystem assembly. And so in a short talk, uh, I don't have enough time to go through the individual components. But I guess the first thing I do then is direct you to the website that we have that uh, will relay a lot of the detail of these features. But in this model of ecosystem assembly, the typology itself uh, integrates an assessment of how abiotic and biotic drivers shape ecosystem properties. And crucially, this helps identify where ecosystems are shaped by similar drivers due to sharing processes of, and functions. And my introduction slide, that picture of the Drakensberg and thinking about the Central Highlands is a very good example of that. Another example would be the savannah biome more generally where this vast biome covers around 20% of the Earth's land surface and is composed by numerous ecosystems across continents that have unique floras. But where, for example, savannah ecosystems uh, that are shaped by fire across continents, they can now be drawn together by that understanding of the processes that govern community assembly and therefore its character characteristic biodiversity despite uh, regionally distinct flora and fauna. So in this model of ecosystem assembly, we can think about how abiotic and biotic drivers filter assemblages to form evolutionary pressures that in turn shape ecosystem properties. And that ecosystems, therefore at their heart, which I think is probably quite intuitive, uh, ecosystems that share processes and functional properties when shaped by similar drivers, such as the Drakensberg uh, and the Central Highlands. Uh, and this is, I guess, getting more practical, is that this typology is supported by a web interface that can be used to explore biomes and ecosystems and where there are descriptions of each functional group on Earth, whether it's a submarine vent, uh, tundra ecosystems to the pyric savannas or the fire adapted savannas that are here. Uh, it's a really great resource. It's really detailed and it aims to draw out basically our contemporary scientific understanding of ecosystems for application and policy. And these are kind of the two key documents that are associated with this. I'm getting the boring stuff out of the way here in this talk. So behind the nice website are these two documents. And on the left here uh, is the ecosystem typology, which is a book containing a vast amount of information about the varied ecosystems on earth 
and where you'll find consistent profiles and descriptions of each of those ecosystems. And on the right uh, is a link to a paper that synthesizes our approach at its analysis and its application that is also linked to the review process that the IUCN typology went through to be adopted. So just then, I guess a couple of slides back, I showed you a coarse global map that reflects uh, distributions of dominant biomes and ecosystems uh, across Earth. Uh, for example, the wide expanses of savannas across Africa, Australia and Brazil. But just like in this picture, I think we all know that at a landscape scale, ecosystems more or less occur in mosaics. And this is particularly the case in topographically complex environments, such as in the central highlands of Madagascar. And here in this uh, picture, we have at least three ecosystems in one area, but our ecosystem typology still applies. So I guess my larger point is that while if you're diving into the ecosystem typology and looking at its mapping, by its very nature and its global nature, you'll see this kind of coarse resolution kind of global mapping. But we all know in practice, and this is especially important for when it comes to any kind of management interventions or restoration interventions that are a part of this program, is that we think very carefully about ecosystem, ecosystem positioning within landscapes. So here we can see a forest, a fire sensitive ecosystem constrained at the base of the hill by a small river and surrounded by a grassland and savanna. And while each of these ecosystems clearly have different structural attributes, like tree cover, they also crucially each support a unique assembly of species with characteristic traits to successfully grow and compete in that ecosystem relative to the drivers that shape that ecosystem. So at this point, I hope <laughs> that it can be helpful to talk about how the global understanding of ecosystems has shifted through time and how different disciplines use different elements of that thinking, uh, where it is still actually also catching up with where ecology is today. Ecology developed through scientists such as Humboldt, uh, but where it's also these scientists who were foundational in early thinking about biomes and their global limits as being determined by climate. This thinking continues in some disciplines and forums today. And through the 1900s, ideas of climate limiting biomes and ecosystems also merged with ideas of structure, particularly related to tree cover. So in that case, 19th and 20th century thinking around ecosystems and their values and their limits looked a little bit like this. And what mattered here were trees. And in, in many ways, as someone who comes from Australia, I think this is a particularly European way of seeing things, whether it's from a colonial point of view, considering potential resource extraction or extending understanding or projecting understanding of European ecosystems to novel contexts in the tropics, where they're essentially predicting outside of their realms of understanding. Research over the last 20 years has shown particularly how flawed this is. And this is where our kind of thinking around processes and dynamics of ecosystems has really accelerated and changed over the last 20 years. These are just examples from two studies that show three really important things uh, related to how structure doesn't work and climate doesn't work in terms of predicting ecosystem limits or predicting biome limits. In the top graph uh, up here, it shows a relationship between tree cover and rainfall. And this relationship is derived from remotely sensed data from uh, the MODIS satellite uh, in the mid 2000s. And what it does show is that there are very wide ranges of tree cover 
possible for any given rainfall and that there is also a very wide distribution of tree cover. Now this distribution of tree cover relates to the African continent and what it really importantly shows us is that tree cover alone isn't sufficient to actually distinguish savanna from forest when we relate this to on-ground measures of ecosystem understanding. It also really importantly demonstrates that climate doesn't equal biome and that these very uh, deterministic systems of thinking around how climate uh, is predictive of biome are really quite flawed. In some circumstances, they're not in the incredibly unproductive, harsh environments of very cold places or very dry places. There's a limited number of possibilities of ecosystems that can occur. But for most swathes of the world, climate doesn't actually predict biome. Then in this bottom graph here, it's a really nice study that looks at something very simple, and it's often the simple studies that are the most powerful, is that there's a regression between herbaceous cover or grass cover and tree canopy cover. And this is contrasting two types of grassy ecosystems. One are recently derived savanna ecosystems where there's been a conversion from forest to savanna and one from an old growth savanna ecosystem. And what it also shows us is a degree to which structure can mask degradation. And this is really important because it tells us that when we ignore biodiversity processes, functions and species traits, we get spurious relationships and understanding about what an ecosystem might be. And I think this is something we probably all uh, intuitively know, but sometimes uh, I think also struggle to apply when we're sitting in large policy frameworks. And these are two images of regrowing forest, uh, but they're formed in Madagascar, that is formed entirely of Australian species, eucalyptus, scrivillia and acacia. And here structural metrics of tree cover simply don't represent restoration but are in fact a process of degradation within a landscape, whether it's through loss of an original forest or a previous forest, or it's a loss of a previous grassland ecosystem. While these forested ecosystems here might provide some level of service in terms of fuel and building materials, they can also have larger negative impacts related to lowering surface water availability and increasing fire risks. But what's been really clear from the various studies uh, over the last couple of decades is the degree to which we cannot use structural and climatic definitions of biomes uh, and ecosystems. They can assist us in mapping basic attributes like above ground carbon, but they cannot be used to define biomes. They cannot recognize degradation and therefore crucially in managing increasing uncertainty due to climate change uh, or safeguarding biodiversity. They have limited utility. And that's because we know that ecosystems are really complex places made up of a multitude of abiotic and biotic interactions. And I think as ecologists, our job is to try and understand that. So with that in mind, I think it's, it's important to go back to process and that a wide array of processes shape ecosystems. Many are interacting uh, and modern ecology centers process and function. These are just some of those processes of which there are many. And in that case, it's key then to also consider ecosystems as whole entities, where we're integrating understanding attributes of species, whether it's uh, bark thickness in a tree or the re-sprouting capacity of a plant or the phenology of the flora and how these elements of life history strategies shape ecosystems and how those elements of life history strategies are shaped by the processes and functions that govern those ecosystems. 
And from this much more holistic standpoint, integrating abiotic and biotic processes while accounting for feedbacks within the ecosystems allows recognition of the unique functional traits of ecosystems, and importantly also how human activity influences ecosystem properties. This approach is more mechanistic and therefore predictive. And what is ecology for if not to understand ecosystems and use that predictive understanding to manage ecosystem change and vulnerability in the face of increasing pressures and climate change? And it's here in this slide uh, with these pictures that I'm also trying to start touching on what open versus closed ecosystems are and how they're fundamentally shaped. And this comes back to this uh, thinking around process and drivers. This is a bit of an undergraduate ecology uh, slide, and I'm sorry for that. Uh, I didn't have any better graphics. But related to 19th and 20th century thinking about ecosystems, succession is an absolutely central concept. And it's developed from landscape scale studies of disturbance and recovery that kind of became pervasively applied to global concepts of ultimate or climax ecosystems generally being forest or closed canopy ecosystems. Yet around 50 to 60 percent of all terrestrial ecosystems on Earth are not forest. Uh, and I guess, as I said before, in very cold or very dry landscapes, ecosystems can be climatically determined because of very low productivity. But for the vast majority of the world, uh, this is not quite the case. They're actually quite productive environments across much of the temperate and tropical zones. And succession as a com concept, I think, does essentially hinge on disturbance being a largely an idiosyncratic feature that resets an ecosystem and thus where light competition is the key process. And that's what this graphic here portrays going from left to right, is we've kind of, we've had some sort of massive disturbance and we're going through now a process of colonization to become an ultimate climax system. And that's simply because succession is driven by taller plants. And that's because competition for light is asymmetric. As you get taller, you're able to overtop shorter plants and those shorter plants become excluded from an ecosystem through less light availability and through presumably also competition and then the biotic feedbacks that are changing ecosystem attributes such as microclimates uh, and ground layer light availability. But in this sense, uh, it doesn't actually match what we can see where we have ecosystems of fundamentally different statures that have different compositions and different traits. And also I'd say from a fitness point of view, it doesn't make much sense for a species to reduce its own chance of survival through overtopping related to light competition. So I think succession is a very useful concept applied at a landscape scale in an appropriate setting and it can be applied in a restoration sense in an appropriate setting but what has also happened is that the concept of succession broadened out to apply to a larger set of ecosystems but what this does also help us reflect on is where ecosystems are closed in terms of closed canopy ecosystems and where also ecosystems might be open but maintained as open ecosystems through reinforcing feedbacks between plant traits and disturbance processes. And this is generally the kind of the main point underpinning a distinction between how we conceptualize open ecosystems and closed ecosystems. And it's that capacity of plants to influence the recruitment of plants with different sets of ecological strategies or different sets of life history strategies. So here on the left hand side, we've got uh, a broad swathe of open ecosystems related to savannas, grasslands, shrublands and heathlands. 
And these are all ecosystems we'd consider as being essentially disturbance driven. And they can be shaped by disturbance, whether it's over annual cycles, decadal cycles, and even centennial cycles. But that this is a key process, disturbance, whether it's in the form of fire or herbivory, uh, in shaping those ecosystems. In contrast, on the right hand side, we've got closed ecosystems. And these are places that are driven really where light competition is a crucial feature and where that local scale succession concept is applied. And definitely also thinking about the differentiation of forest types has also really evolved over the last uh, decades, thinking around differentiation between dry forests, rainforests, uh, thickets uh, uh, across different parts of the tropics. And it's this broad categorization related to processes uh, of maintaining ecosystems as open or closed that's quite crucial. I can see I've gone over time, so I'm going to start wrapping this up. Uh, but I do want to make a couple of last points. That is to think also about how concepts of ecosystems are applied in different policy frameworks. Uh, and where our thinking is and isn't moving forward at a fast enough pace and how that applies and influences then really key uh, restoration uh, activities and thinking about ecosystem management into the future in the face of changing climates uh, and increasing uh, vulnerability of ecosystems. Uh, global policy organisations tend to use uh, structural definitions of ecosystems. And partially, I think this is also through ease of monitoring due to the revolution in remote sensing and the capacity to observe kind of land cover metrics. Uh, we've had this revolution in earth observation data that means we have new and consistent data but I think that this can be best described as land cover data rather than ecological data. So an important element for us in thinking about uh, restoration, thinking about ecosystem functionality and ecosystem resilience in the face of increasing uncertainty is to think about how we can apply our current thinking of ecology to restoration activities and to move beyond what is relatively outdated thinking around structural attributes defining ecosystems. When it comes to these large uh, organisations, in many ways, it's really uh, not a surprise that that thinking is lagging, but we are at a crucial point where that lag does have impact on how we think about uh, ecosystems and how we support uh, ecosystem functionality in the coming century. I think that anyone who's been part of a large organisation knows that it can be hard to change policy and thinking. And in this case, it's not a surprise that uh, current ecology is lagging in that integration into global frameworks. But it doesn't mean also that as ecologists, it shouldn't be our aim. I had a whole bunch of other slides to share about the impacts uh, of tree planting related to environmental risk and very water availability, but I'm really over time and you have a tight schedule. Uh, so I'm going to very quickly wrap up on open that I was asked to mention. Uh, open uh, is the Open Ecosystems Network. It's a global network that aims to foster understanding of the value of open ecosystems amongst policymakers and the public. It draws on the expertise of around 120 affiliated scientists. Uh, you can go to our website and you can uh, have a look at uh, affiliates. You can get in touch with us if you have questions or if you would like to participate. So thanks very much for listening uh, and I hope you have a really great uh, productive day of discussions. Uh, these are just links to the IUC in ecosystem typology. I really recommend that everyone uh, has a read and 
uh, think about how they might relate uh, ecosystems in Madagascar to this typology. Bye.